All right, thanks for coming this morning. Nowhere near as much fun without you. What time is it? It is 10.55. We'll be done an hour, an hour and a half. At, at, yeah, so don't worry. Okay. You know, context is important, isn't it? Understanding something in context. In my studies that I'm taking in school, we, I did two weeks of contextualization. It relates to words like indigenization and uh, incarnation and all kinds of things. Well, when you're talking about Scripture, context is important. If you want to understand the text, you've got to understand the context. Now, here's the deal. Every once in a while you'll find a statement in the text of Scripture that fits the context, but also can be universally applied for almost any portion of Scripture. Now, we see this in the, gospel, in the, in the, in the letter of, rather, of 1 John. John is writing to his audience, and he deals with a whole lot of subjects. And in the middle of this one big portion that we're going to read together. I believe in the public reading of Scripture. So we're going to read this together, and you're going to lift up your voice, and you're not going to get discouraged, and you're not going to put it on the screen before I'm saying I'm ready for it. That's terrible. Okay, here's the deal. And we're going to come to one point that's darker, it's bold, and that's when you preach it. Okay, so you get your preacher voice on and you turn to your neighbor and you look at the screen and you preach it at them. Okay, because the context of Scripture matters, but sometimes there's a text within the context that applies to all contexts. And you're going to see this in this portion. Are you ready? Now, oh, the other thing I have to warn you is I do not read well um, in public. I, 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 I back, I, I, sometimes I, I, I'm. I'm I, I'm wixing up my merds, and uh, I'm back in talk words. And uh, so it's really a mess. Okay? So stay with me if I get it all messed up. Just keep on reading. Just say, you know, it's too bad the Canadian system didn't teach them to read. Okay, you ready? All right, so you ready? And there's quite a few verses, so don't get discouraged. And by the way, well, here's what happens. Sometimes we'll start out really, and then we'll just, uh, 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 we just okay? There's several verses here. So you got to stay with me. Ready? See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Stop. I was looking up there. I couldn't see you, but some of you weren't reading out loud. <laughs> Petey's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I can tell some of you weren't reading. So let's lift up our voice. Are you ready? See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin." No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Am I doing good, Ruth? Going good? Yeah. Am I going good, sir? Okay, yeah, she's always nervous when I read out loud like this. Okay, you ready? Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Shh, stop. This is the point where we preach. So practice it. Get it in your mind, okay? Read it over to yourself. The reason the Son of God appeared. Okay, you ready? Now, this is one we really lift up our voices and go for, okay? You ready? 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Come on, let's say that together. You ready? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. This is the text within the context that applies to the context, but it applies to all other contexts as well. Get this deep in your spirit, man. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. That's why he came. Now let's move on. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love his brother and his sister. 1 John 3, verses 1 through to 10. There's a grand reason why Jesus came. He actually came. John was arguing with a group of people, and he was arguing in this, in this, in this letter that he wrote to his audience. He was actually arguing with a, a, with a, with a, 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 a philosophy or a, a, a theology that was called Gnosticism, which Gnosticism, which means to know. And part of what they believed at that time was that Jesus didn't really appear in the flesh. He actually was kind of like a, a vision or an apparition or whatever that. We just kind of saw him, but he wasn't really in the flesh. And John is arguing here that Jesus Christ actually did come in the flesh. And the reason he came was to destroy the works of the devil. He wasn't just come some sort of ethereal being. He actually was here. Now, here's the other thing we learn, is that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Do you know that the devil is working? He is out to destroy us. I don't know how somebody could, could watch the news or read a newspaper or somebody could be in any way understanding what's going on around us and not know there was a devil. It was bizarre for Bethany and I. We went the other day to um, the Altoona Area School District, and we went to meet with some folks in their office. And, and, and we had to go through a metal detector to go in and see somebody in an office. And, of course, because of the steel plate in my head, it kept going on. It was awful. But I'm just telling you, it was, it was just not a good thing. And then, not only that, we had to, we had to take out our license and show our license and um, then, they, then they gave us a sticker we had to wear. And I had to put my stuff in that little bin and all that stuff. And, 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 and I'm, going, I'm going into a school, a place that used to be a safe place. How can one, how can one not notice that the, the devil is working? But Jesus came It's like, the, it's like the kid at the it's, it's like the kid at the at the at the, at, the, at the beach. He makes a sandcastle, and some other kid comes along and destroys that sandcastle by kicking it. Here's the deal: Jesus Christ came to kick down the devil's sandcastle. No matter how hard he works, the cross is the answer to school violence. The cross is the answer to some of the things we face in, in Lower Fairview, which we call Hope Community. The cross is the answer to the needs of our cities and our countrysides and our politicians and of our sportsmen and of our lowest and of our highest. The cross is the answer to academia's problem. Listen to me, friends. The cross is the answer. Jesus Christ comes to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy these things. The reason why Jesus, why the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. There's a contrast between what the devil is doing and what Jesus is doing. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, John 10 and 10. This is what the devil does. 
He steals, he kills, and he destroys. Whenever you see stealing, I don't care if a politician does it, the next door neighbor's kid does it, or if uh, if some business person does it and embezzles millions from his clients, well, whoever's doing the stealing, that is not just that person doing it, it is inspired by hell itself. Whenever you see killing, it's not from heaven, it's from hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? Understand this. We have a binary situation, we have a choice, we have a polarized situation, we have a situation where heaven is endeavoring to do one thing and hell is doing something else, but thanks be to God who through Jesus Christ who gives us the victory. We have victory in Jesus. Jesus Christ is destroying the works of the devil. Isn't that good news? It's good news. The devil loves the stuff of killing, stealing, and destroying. Now, this is interesting because often many of us get confused, don't we? How many have heard this? Where was God? Where was God when that school shooter did what that school shooter said? And it's interesting. Everybody gets blamed, including God, except for the one who really inspired the whole thing to begin with. And that's the devil himself. It's the devil that's into killing and stealing and destroying. But Christ's redemptive work is to bring life and to bring us life to its full. Anything that robs you of his fullness in your life, anything that robs you of the fullness of Jesus Christ is not of God. It's from the enemy. Now, we can get into kind of esoteric uh, uh, biblical discussions on, on, you know, what about sickness and what about, you know, people dying and this and that. And, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit about death in a bit. And, and, and I think you'll see a couple things. But, but it's important to understand that ultimately sickness, death, uh, stealing, killing, lying, cheating, adultery, all of that comes from hell. The devil is lying to people about what he is trying to do. It's interesting how the devil will lie to us and he will begin to blame God for the things that he himself is inspiring. He is making evil look good and good look evil. It's amazing to me that there, there, is, a, there is a wave of, of, of pressure on, on Christians in America, and it's nothing to what it is in other countries, but we're just starting to sense it. We're beginning to feel the pains of what it means to be marginalized, and, um, and not just marginalized, despised. And we're being lied about, about who we are. And yes, do believers make mistakes and do things that are wrong from time to time? Yes, we do. And sometimes we deserve some of the criticism we get. But having said that, I want you to know the church of Jesus Christ is the church of Jesus Christ. And he bought and he paid for it with his own blood. And we're here not because we decided to be here. We're here because Jesus Christ died and he bought the church. He owns the church. But here's another example of a universal truth emerging from a specific context. Jesus is speaking here. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry on your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Think of murder. That does not come from heaven. That comes from hell. Not holding to the truth. Anytime you see error and lying, that is from hell. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He is a liar and the father of lies. Now here's the thing. There is a statement here that applies to the context of the scripture, but this is a universal statement that can be applied to almost any situation. When you hear the devil speak, he'll be telling you a lie or he'll be telling you the truth with the intention of deceiving you. Look at these pictures. A few pictures coming up. Go ahead, the next one. Go ahead. That actually was the recent shooting in Florida. Give me another one. Killing. Stealing. Destroying. I want you to know the heart of Jesus Christ grieves when he sees those things. 
That is not the will of God. That is not what he desires. That is not his plan for humanity. And Bryce, the Lord must be into this. Aha. Because my, my pages have gone missing from my iPad. We'll put them here and see what happens. Maybe they'll appear. But here's the deal, folks. Every one of those things are not God's plan for us. Now, here's what we know. We know that the devil is a liar and he lies to us. We know that he lies to us about ourselves. Do you know the devil tells you lies about yourself? You're not going to make it. You don't have what it takes. Your life is a mess. You're too old. You're too young. You're too, you're from Canada. How many times was I told when I first moved here many years ago, you're not one of us, are you? I remember this man came to me one time in church in Miami, and of course Miami is full of immigrants. And he came up to me, and he said, these immigrants are destroying our country. And I stood there, and I nodded. Yes, yes, they are. And I said, I've noticed this ever since I moved to this country. <laughs> he lies to us about ourselves. He lies to others about us. You know, they don't like you. You ever hear that? You ever hear that in your spirit? Do you see the way they, they, didn't, they didn't acknowledge you? Do you see the way? Do you, th do you think that's from heaven? Do you, think, do you think heaven's stirring up that kind of dissension in your home you know, or, or in, your, in, in, in your family members? Did you see the last family reunion we had? You know, the, did you notice how she never, and, and, and he never come over, and then remember, and, 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 they, and when you were walking over, he just walked away, and, and, and the, love, the devil just loves to stir up that kind of lying all the time. Friends, and when you buy into that, what are you actually doing? You're believing the lies. He lies to us about God. He tells us that God did certain things to us that God did not do. He lies about God to us. He lies to us about God, and he lies to God about us. That's interesting that he actually goes to God and says, you know what, Jodhry is... Jodhry's a hypocrite. He actually tells God things about me. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, his stealing, his killing, his destroying. And when we think about that, beloved, understand, and this is very encouraging, isn't it, when you see me just paint, turning page after page after page. He kills, of course, through traffic accidents. He kills through abortion. He kills through suicide. He kills through drug overdoses. He kills through wars and so much more. He destroys our futures. He destroys our potential. He destroys our neighborhoods. He destroys our nations. He destroys systems that were heretofore working, but now he gets into anything. I tell you, what's interesting about the devil, he's into anything that deteriorates. Anytime you see stealing, killing, and destroying, it's a work of the enemy. Now, there are two key things the enemy uses to destroy us. And I want to read to us, I want you to read with me, because again, the word is so important. You get the word in you. Let's read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Are you ready? Let's lift up our voice. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are from the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. You know, we call each other brother and sister. Some people you know, think I'm really old-fashioned because I call people sister. It means I can't remember your name, okay? And just be thankful that I can get a gender correct when I look at you, if I do. Now, brother, if I call you sister, you know, again, it's just a... But it's interesting. Jesus also calls us brothers and sisters. We're from the same family. We're heirs of the Father, and we're joint heirs with the Son, Jesus. Jesus calls us a brother or a sister. 
Isn't that great news? And we're from the same family. The one who is holy and the one who's being made holy. Now listen to this. Go on a few verses later and listen to what it says. Come on, lift up your voice. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free all those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. Now, this is interesting. Listen to me, friends. A Martian couldn't have done it. One of us couldn't have done it. No one else could have done it. Only Jesus Christ could have done it. For this reason, he, Jesus, had to be made like us, fully human in every way, and yet God himself. And listen, in order that me might become a merciful and faithful high priest, he came to represent us. He came to be one of us. But go back to the slide previous, if you will, and you'll see something here. It's so important. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's us. He had to share in their humanity. He had to become like us so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is whom? The devil. And free all those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You see, we're flesh and blood. Jesus had to become human if he was going to help humans. His agenda in coming is to break the power of the devil by his work on the cross. And we are in this Lenten season and we're heading toward Good Friday. Understand that, that all the things and all the kind of the, the stuff that's going on, just understand this, there was a reason why Jesus came. He also comes to free us from the fear of death. Two key things the devil uses to hinder and destroy us is the despair of fear and death itself. And then you put those two things together and they become a devilish combination, which is the fear of death. Now, death is a reality that we still deal with in our lives. It came as a result of our sin. The Bible says this, the one who sins, what? Will die. You and I have sinned. We have had parents who sinned and their parents before them and all the way back to Adam and Eve. Death came as a result of our sin. But Christ's cross destroys all of the effect of sin, but it doesn't happen all at once, does it? We're still aging, and we're all still headed toward death. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 and 26 says this, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So we know that this last enemy that will be destroyed, not by something that will be done in the future, but by something that's already been done 2,000 years ago, will be destroyed, and that is death itself will one day be fully destroyed. Here's what Hebrews says. Hebrews says, people are destined to die once. So we're all going to face death and the death of those around us, but this is not the end for us. This is, this is the despair of death. I want, you to tell, I want you to know this. The despair of death is this, that I'm going to come to the end of my life and it's going to be the end of my life. But for you and I, the coming to the end of our life is not the end of our life. That's the difference. But the devilish lie about death that the enemy uses about, against us about death is this, is that when I die, that's it. That's the despairing part of death. That's the horrific part of death. That's the scratching and clawing and saying, I don't want to go there part of death. But a believer has a different perspective on death. Why is that? Because we know there's something beyond the grave that's far greater than anything we had before the grave. Now, here's the deal. We are going to face death, and that death 
of course, will be our gateway. Now, it's interesting, and I'm going to try to illustrate something to you somewhat safely. But there's a scripture that says this, and you know this. You know it from the King James Version. And not often do I say this, too often do I say this, but the NIV does such a, ni- a much better uh, job with this portion of Scripture because it illustrates it better. Do you realize that you straddle two different worlds? You're not in this world only. You're not fully in the world yet to come. You actually straddle two different worlds. And what does 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 say? Therefore, come on, lift up your voice. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Now here's what it is. My natural life now, the full kingdom to come, and death is the doorway between the two. You see, when I was an unbeliever, I lived totally over here. This is where I lived. This was natural and normal to me. But the scripture says, when I was in Christ, the new creation has come. The new kingdom. I've already begun to pass over. I've already begun to die to the old way, the old life, the old system. I'm still living here in a sense of I work and I drive a car and I have a house and I raise my kids and I pay my taxes and I eat hamburgers and I love dill pickles. All those things are a part of my life now. But here's the deal, folks. I, 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 I can't, I'm, I'm, but I'm already, but, but you know what? There's something yearning. You see, that's why, that's why this morning when we sang Because He Lives, some of you, some of you got so excited. I saw somebody go like this. It was amazing. You started to raise your hands. I didn't know if you were trying to get an Uber or if you were actually placing the Lord. But anyway, it was really exciting there for a moment. Why is that? Because we have beating within our spirit man and the spirit of God was here and he's revealing truth to us and beating within our spirit man was this heartfelt desire to move from over here to over here. Why? Because we are straddling two kingdoms. This is wonderful. And some of you wouldn't clap for your mama if she was standing here. Come on, let's put our hands together and say this is wonderful. Isn't this great? Anyone is in Christ, that's us. The new creation has come, the new kingdom. The old is gone, our old life under the kingdom of darkness. The new is here, our new life in God's kingdom, which is not fully here until we get to heaven, has actually begun for us. Therefore, death is not a final thing for us. This here deal here is not the final thing. I don't lay down in death and say, oh no, I'm gone. No, no, no. This is actually, this is actually my pathway to get here. Isn't this good news? Because I am already in the future kingdom now, I do not need to fear death. The enemy is trying to use fear of death to bring us into bondage. It gets us to cling to stuff here. I remember as a child having family devotions with our family. And my father praying for Bob Hoskins. Karen, you'll know that name. Bob Hoskins, a, a, just an, an AG kind of legend. And we used to pray for Bob Hoskins because we lived in Canada and New Brunswick and David Crabtree was our pastor and we supported Bob Hoskins as a missionary as many of you supported some missionaries this morning. And he was in Beirut. And Beirut was once the jewel of the 
Middle East. It was where everybody went to vacation. It was a peaceful place. Most of you only know Beirut because it's been a pretty rough spot for the last several decades. But back in the 60s, it actually was. But then it started to enter into its time of trouble. And Bob Hoskins talks about this. You see, this is an illustration. This is an illustration. You see, he was very successful over there. And he, and like a lot of missionaries do, he had a lot of artifacts and things that he had bought over the years. And his house was filled with. And, 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 and they were literally running for their lives. He actually grabbed his wife and children, physically grabbed them, and began to run for their lives through the streets as the bombs began to drop in Beirut, Lebanon. And his wife said, oh, Bob, what about our stuff? You see, here he was, and here they were as a family. I don't mean to make, put her in a bad light, but here he was, and they were straddling two kingdoms. But for a second, his wife began to say, but oh, Bob, what about our stuff? And what Bob says is this, let it burn. Let it burn, because I'm fully over here, and my stuff doesn't matter. You know one of the signs of suicide is this? It was when people start giving away their stuff. You know one of the signs that, that people are getting older? They start giving away their stuff. They start to pass. Now, Sister Ruth, you've been getting older since we were married. You're always getting rid of stuff. She used to love it when I traveled. I'd come home. My stuff would be missing. I was ready to call the police on her one time. I said, you have, you, you, have, you have stolen my stuff and taken it to Goodwill. It's not right. With the help of a counselor, we got through it. Here's the deal. When you start to get rid of your stuff, you're starting to say, this old world will never hold me. Any moment now, I'll be gone. For I've made... Since we're singing, this is, this is like having Bill Gaither here this morning with, uh, with Pastor Troy. <laughs> For I've made my preparation. I've got my wedding garments on. What are we saying? I'm going to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I'm getting out of here. I've already straddled the kingdom. Now I'm ready to get over in the other side. Come on, somebody. I'm ready to get over in the other side. <laughs> but fear is bondage the enemy uses to kill and steal and destroy us. It robs us of our present possibilities. You see, when I live in fear, I'm, what am I doing? I'm overcome with, with a, a kind of an inertia. I, I can't move. I can't do anything. It holds me. It, I, it's like my feet are cemented to the floor. That's what fear does to us. And the fear of death even is worse. Why? Because it holds me to, to, to doom. It holds me to gloom. It holds me to, to something that's, that's beyond uh, uh, my ability to get out of it. It's like a fog that, over, that envelops you. Everywhere you look, you can't see it for, 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 uh, for, for, for a few feet in front of you. I, Sister Ruth and I have a, have a, have a good friend, and, and he is a man well in, up in years, and he has been, he has been injured as, when he was a missionary, and he was, he was terribly, terribly, it just, it just, just totally debilitated. And yet, it's interesting, even in his years and even as he spends time in and out of hospitals and all of this, he keeps planning for stuff in the future. The fear of death will never let you plan for the future. Because all you think about is, I'm heading out of here. I'm not going to make it. And while death is yet to be fully destroyed, the fear of death has been destroyed. Here's what the scripture says. We read it already. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free all those who were all their lives held in slavery by the fear of death. Jesus came not just to destroy physical death. He came to destroy the fear of death. I watched my father transition. You can go to that next slide. Transition from this life to the next. With great grace and peace. Because he was already in the new kingdom. I wasn't there. I regret deeply I wasn't there. I miss my father's passing. I was on the way. 
was two and a half years ago, and I, I preached my father's funeral. And you folks sent us some flowers. They were on the, on the left side. And uh, I thank God for the Canadian flag that draped over his casket. It was the cheapest casket in the history of the world. It was a cardboard box with wallpaper on it. And um, we were celebrating my father's death, but I'm told that by my brothers, and, they, and there was people there, more than one, that my brother retired that very day. <laughs> and my brother retired, and my father was always a, a jokester. I can't deal with people that are always joking around, but anyway, he, he was a jokester. And he, he, my brother, he was always concerned about my brother having to drive these 40, 45 miles to work every day, and of course in the snow and all that in the wintertime. And so it was, my brother, my, my brother was retiring, and, and my father passed on November the 13th, and, and, uh, um, and so my brother was retiring before kind of winter set in, and my father was so glad. And so the very day, and so my brother arrives at my father's bedside at about noontime that day, and he said, Dad, I'm done. My father looked at him and said, so am I. <laughs> and that was the last words he spoke. And it came to the point of death when they were singing and praying. And, and I, I'm just telling you what they said. I'm not, you know, I'm not making a theology out of it. And I'm not saying if it didn't happen to you this way or somebody else this way. I'm just saying this is what happened to my dad. Just a kind of a little grin on his face. And then his hands, which were contorted this way, turned and were this way. He was, he was leaning for months. He was leaning for months. You see what I'm saying? He's leaning for months. But his hand turned this way. He's not leaning anymore. For absent from the body is present with the Lord. I'm going to tell you two quick little stories. You, you and I both know they won't be quick. After our third child was born, we, 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 we love most of our children. And, and um, after, we actually, we actually have three children, one of each, and uh, they're, they're, they're all boys except for two. And, um, but... After our third child was born, my wife uh, had this terrible problem. Um, she couldn't gain. She, she, she actually kept losing weight. Uh, and she kept just going down and down and down in weight. And, and uh, it was really quite sickening um, because she would, the doctor told her, you're going to have to gain weight. And she was down like to 92 pounds, the same weight as I am in my right leg. And, um, and, and so... Um, he told her to eat six meals a day. I cannot tell you how discouraging it is to be eating an orange in bed and watching her eat a banana split. And um, it's just not fair. But she just, not only did she get physically ill, but she became kind of tormented by thoughts of death. It was a very difficult time. And, and she, we would be sleeping, and she would wake me up in the night, and because that's when we sleep, and um, she would wake me up and she'd say, she'd poke me a couple times and then she'd say, you don't care. Now I have to admit, I did not care. <laughs> At that point in the day, I didn't care, okay? And so she'd be poking me, saying, you don't, you don't care. And I'd say, well, what is it, sweetheart, that I don't care about other than sleep? Um, and she said, well, what, what, what will happen if the children die? And this didn't happen just once or twice. It happened quite a few times. And because she was tormented with the, one of the children are going to die. And one night I remember saying to her in the middle of the night, sweetheart, if the children die, we will cry. We will grieve. Our hearts will be broken. We will bury those children, sort of like my heart was broken when she kept waking me up. We will bury those children, and we'll grieve some more, 
and we'll go on with our life. And we'll serve Jesus. I thank the Lord that over the next several months, we were able to, she was able to get some help. And I remember one day, she told me that she went downstairs into the basement where she had really, and there was more to this story because one of our close friends had just died a very violent death. I mean, extremely violent death. The lady was actually there at the birth of our third child. And it was an extremely difficult time for us. And she had died this horrifically violent death. And that probably was some of the impetus. And where the washer and the dryer was was sort of like in the bowel of the house. It was awful. You felt like something was going to grab you when you went down there or something. You know, the, the big hand. And she went down there because every time she said she went down there, she said fear would overcome her just being in that. Which could explain why the laundry kept piling up. But she said she would go down there and... And by the way, some of the things that I'm saying are jokes here in the past few minutes. Okay, everybody, the laundry didn't pile up and don't go to my wife and say, we've got some Tide Pods for you. Don't eat them, but use them for the laundry or something. But she remembers one day she went down there and she began to speak to the spirit of fear that was in that room. And she says, spirit of fear, you go in the name of Jesus. You don't own me and you don't own my family and you don't own my children and my children are in the hands of God and he is their protector. And, their, and, and she just began to speak to the spirit of fear that was in that, in that laundry room. And that began the process of God delivering her from that fear. Now, race ahead several years, a few decades, and six years ago, was it, was it six years or seven years, almost seven years ago, but it was that, began, I think, six years ago, last August, when I began to have what was heart attack-like symptoms. Chest pain and arm numbness, racing heart, um, and incredible anxiety. I remember the first time it happened, we, it was on a day off, and we, were, we, we, we weren't in the community long enough to even know where the hospital was. So we went to the urgent care. We were going to go to the veterinary clinic, but we said, no, the urgent care. So, so we, we go to the urgent care, and... and they didn't even want to have anything to do with me. You know, they didn't want anything to do with me. And so they just kept giving me aspirin to take, and I was chomping them down. They'd called the ambulance, and I went, and went through all this big, long process, and did a heart cath, and, and uh, yeah, nothing happened, nothing. But I kept having these horrible symptoms of pain in the chest, arm, heart racing. And... So then they said, well, maybe there's something else wrong. And so they decided that the best thing to do is take out my gallbladder. I used to, my mother used to say, you have a lot of gall. And um, so uh, they took out my gallbladder, and, 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 and in taking out my gallbladder, things never changed. I went back three weeks later to see if I get it back, but they, they didn't have it. Because um, I thought, well, they'd put it back in free. It'd be fine. But... It just kept going. But all the while, I'm having these panic attacks, what later become known as panic attacks. I was thinking about dying. And I thought about dying not once a day, not twice a day, not five times a day, not ten times a day, hundreds of times a day. In fact, if I wasn't consciously thinking about something else, and, and by the way, it's all right to train your mind to think about something else. The scripture says, think on these things. Memorize the books of the Bible. Memorize them backwards. M memorize all the verses I've memorized and say them. At night, this would come to me. Can I just say to you, I don't know where this is in the notes and I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting done, but anything that comes to you at night, be aware of it. Especially if it's disturbing and upsetting. He's a lover of darkness. We're not just talking metaphorically. I believe he loves the darkness. Be aware of anything that comes at night. You ever notice when you worry about something at night and you get up in the morning and go, what in the world was that all about? That's the stupidest thing. 
That is the dumbest thing. I can go and get another quart of milk somewhere else. I will not mistakenly feed iPods to the children. Or not iPods. <laughs> Tide Pods, not iPods. I don't think you should serve iPods to your children either. Feed them apples, but not iPods. <laughs> A little play on words there. Very punographic, eh? Mm, yeah. But here's the thing. At night, I would just be tormented with fears of death. Go to the, go to the, the book of Deuteronomy, and you find out that, that there's, there's these, all these blessings in chapter 28, all these blessings for obedience, and it's about maybe one quarter of the whole chapter, and then the three quarters of the whole chapter is all the things that are going to come against you, all the things that are going to come against you if you walk in disobedience, and there's just one horrific thing after another that's going to come against you. But one of the phrases in that chapter 28 of the book of Deuteronomy is, at night you'll hope for, 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 for that night you'll, 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 you'll pray that you'll come to the morning, and at morning you'll pray for night. Time and at night you'll pray for morning, and at morning you'll pray for nighttime. And I did that day in and week in and week out, and month in and month out. I'd say, If I could only make it to it's time to go to bed, I'll be fine. But then when I go to bed, I'd be tormented by death. And I'd say, Oh, if the, I just can't wait for the sun to come up, and the fear of death enveloped me. It was my default thought if I wasn't concentrating on something else. It was tormenting. And I remember I called the, the, the guy who was serving as our consultant. He also was a, was a counselor. And, 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 and I, I, I called him one day. And I was just overwhelmed. And, and, he, and, he, and he spoke to me for a few minutes. And then he spoke to Ruth. And he, one of the things he wanted to know, he said, is he suicidal? And then he spoke to me and he said, are you suicidal? I said, suicidal? No. I want to live, but I'm not going to. I'm going to die. And then the scripture, can we go back? That's it. No, yeah, no, no, go no, the other way, backwards. Go backwards. Go back. I pray you go back. Okay, here it is. I break into some sort of kind of Shakespearean words here. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And what did he come to do? He came to free those who were all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. And that scripture began to resonate in my mind. Now, there were all kinds of other things going on. I, I won't get into all those other things that were going on. But I'm here to tell you that that scripture began to become a reality, that Jesus Christ didn't just come to free me from death, he came to free me from my fear of death my fear of death, and I began to rejoice. And you know what began to happen? I began to worship God. And you know what? I tell you what, when the enemy attacks you and you worship God, you come at his, his lies and his errors with God's truth by worship. What happens? You set not only yourself free, but you set the environment free from the demonic, from the oppressive, from the overcoming. And Jesus Christ comes in with power. And the only thing I need, knew to do when fear came was to say, Jesus, you're my healer. Jesus, you're my savior. Jesus, if you want to take me, you go ahead because I'm already straddled. I'm already moving over. I'm already on my way. I'm not over here. I'm not doomed. I'm going through death to get the roar life. Here's the deal, beloved. The two key things my colleague is coming, two key things the enemy does. What does he do? He comes at us with what? Death, and with the fear of death. Well, death comes through a man. The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The fact is I am going to die, but I don't have to live in fear of it. Because all I can tell you is I couldn't even carry on sometimes a conversation with you. I would be talking to somebody just about anything, just, just talking about whatever. My work, my ministry, whatever it is. And in the back of my mind is you're dying. You're dying. Do you think that comes from heaven? 
That's not from heaven. Now I want us to read this next scripture together. I want you to lift up your voice. I want you, no, get me now. I, you did real good at first. You did, oh, no, no, you did real good. But this is the one we want to lift up. Come on. Are you ready? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword stop or the fear of death? What's it say? No. What's it say? No. Come on, lift up your voice. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! 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 This is good news! This is good news. <laughs> this is good news. Because he lives. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can face tomorrow. I can lay my head on the pillow and say if I don't wake, you know that prayer, that dumb prayer we pray as kids. Now I lay me down to sleep. Lord, I pray you my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, Bubba, you will not wake if you die. Hello. The dumbest prayer in the world. But you know what? If I should die before I wake, I don't have to pray. Oh, Lord, my soul, I hope you'll take it. I'm already crossed over. I'm already crossed over. Don't look for me. I'll be gone. When daddy was dying, oh my, it's 1148, I'm in trouble. When daddy was dying, we went to see him. Bethany and her husband. I can never remember his name. Brother. Um, Bethany and they weren't married and they, he, he wanted to come. So we went and Nathan came and one of Nathan's children and we drove all the way up and we got there. I went into, went into the room. And Daddy was, he was pretty down. You know, he was down. He just found out. He was diagnosed on June 13th. He went to be with Jesus on November 13th. <laughs> he was down. So I went in the room. It was just me and him there. And Dad, you, you know you did it right. I said, your, your sons are here. I have two brothers. They're twins, dumb and dumber. And, um, and uh, your sons are here. Your grandchildren are here. You've got a great-grandchild here. They're all serving Jesus. Dad, with his grade 7 education, he was saved when he was a drunk. did it right dad and tears came to his eyes and I had to slip out of the room 
And I come back and I said, Dad, you just got to know. We're proud of you. Well, as more people came and he started to get more buoyed and encouraged. And that night he got happier and the next day he was happy. And he was supposed to be in the hospital for I don't know how many days, but he called my mother just, and he said, I'm not staying in as long as they told me I had to stay here. He said, I'm fine, I'm, I'm, I'm coming home. And my mother's name is Willa. He called her Willa the Warden. Willa the War Department. He'd say, he say, Willa, when I'm coming home, I'm not coming home to home, home on the range. I'm coming home to the hallelujah chorus because I'm ready to go. And he did. Ruth and I went up in October and they celebrated their 62nd wedding anniversary and we were there and we went out for a big meal and it's the last meal he paid for because to celebrate their anniversary and that was not true, by the way. And, uh, and then this last few weeks, he just kind of deteriorated. Here's what I'm here to tell you, folks. This isn't fear for us. This is with great joy. Now, here's what I know. There are people in this room, and I, I'm going to pray for you. I even brought mints to put in my mouth so I can pray for you. If you're struggling with anything, and I don't want to put fear or death into this. It could be anything. It could be a sickness. I just want to pray for you this morning. But I don't want it to be this thing where I've got to convince you and come on. And by the way, we don't want it to be a women's ministries meeting either. I've noticed this. You invite people to come and only women come. What is it, men? You're too spiritual to come or what? Come. Come. If you've got a need, Come. You, you, you spouses need to come together if you're praying for a, a, a son or a daughter or, or a grandchildren that are away from God. I believe God can reach them. I know he can. So you know what we're going to sing? We're going to sing because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Come on, all over this room, come, stand. Come, find a place of prayer. Bryce is going to help me. We're going to pray. Come on, Ruth is going to help me. Come, come. Come all over this place. Maybe you're, maybe you're dealing with fear. Maybe you're dealing with this thing about death. Maybe you're dealing with all that. If you want to tell me, you can tell me. Just tell me quickly and I'll pray for you. I'm going to command this thing to go in Jesus' name. All over this room, come, come, come. The Spirit of God is beckoning you. Come, come on, let's go. In the name of Jesus, come, 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 come. I am by, by probably more by calling and nature now a teacher. So let me just teach you very quickly. You cannot get rid of error unless you live in truth. If you're listening to in a bar in Toledo, across from the depot, on a bar stool, she took off a ring. What in the world are you doing in a bar in Toledo, across from the depot? If you're going to listen to error all day long, you're never going to live in truth. Now, I'm not a great music person, okay? I like music, but I'm not a great music person. I had a little blast from the past here in the service, Power and the Blood and all that, and, you know, Bill Gaither was here with us. It was great. But somehow you got to get truth into you. So when I began to worship the Lord, I would worship. And by the way, worship out loud. I didn't say you could sing out loud, just worship out loud, okay? Worship loud enough for your own ears to hear. The Word. There's no reason why you can't read a chapter, two chapters, three chapters, four chapters. I, I'm, what I'm going to say to you right now, I'm not saying to you, I, I used to be so erratic in my Bible reading, and I, you know, I'm not saying this so you can, I'm breaking my arm, patting myself on the back. But in the last few years, I just began to say, I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to read God's Word every day. And for the last more than 38 months, I've missed reading God's Word 10 days. night that, one of them was the night that Bethany told me she was marrying Bryce, and no, it's just, no, never mind, I was just joking. Here's the deal. You can get regular in Bible reading. You just do it. Tonight you do it, and then tomorrow night you do it again. 
next night or next morning, whatever it is you read. You've got to get truth into you. The final thing I would say is if, you're, if you struggle with panic or fear, I've had, I've had panic attacks while I've been preaching. <laughs> now I knew how the audience felt, you know. And um, you know, they're all having panic attacks too. How much longer is this guy going to go on, you know? But once you, are, once you know what the thing is, once you can expose it, you see, the scripture says what? That everything is under the name of Jesus that can be named. Once you begin to name it, this is a panic attack. A few months ago, I had one when I was just about to get up and, and give a lecture with my, with my doctoral colleagues, and I, 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 was, I was just about... And I, I was having a heart attack. I was, in, I was in Pasadena, California a few months ago, and I was, and I was having a heart attack, and I'm, this is, I can't believe I, I'm away from my... I'm going to die alone. And that's, that's, that's a whole... And then it hit me. This is not... This, I've had this a hundred times. You're having a panic attack. Get up and give your lecture. And all my, my colleagues were saying, no, 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 it's all right, Jodry, sit down. We'll, we'll, we'll just keep on going. We don't need you. I said, you do so, and I'm getting up. <laughs> and I get up. Now, it wasn't easy and it wasn't fun. I've had them just before. I got, remember, I was coming back from Chile, and I had one just before I was getting on the plane at midnight to fly back to the United States, and I was ministering there. But exposing it to the light and calling it what it is, this is, this is a panic attack. This is from hell. This is not from heaven. I worship you, Lord. I'm in your hands. No matter what happens, I'm straddling. I'm straddling. I'm, listen, I'm not all over here. I'm actually here, and I'm leaning. Are you listening to me? Call it what it is. Call it fear if it's fear. And don't try to say it's reasonable. It's not reasonable. God didn't give you that. That's right. Now, if a Mack truck's coming at you and you fear a little bit of anxiety, that could be from heaven. That's good fear. Me being afraid of Sister Ruth, that is wise fear. Okay? But there's unnatural fear and you ought not have it call it what it is it's from hell and you expose it to the light hallelujah how many are ready to live in freedom ready to live in freedom victory in jesus victory in jesus and you need to get somebody in the tr in the trenches with you understands and i'm here and i'm with you and pastor will be back the real preacher will be back next week believe god you'll get a good message next week all right thanks pastor <laughs>